Hello there and welcome to Star Wars Comics in Canon, your guide to the wider Star Wars canon through the comic book lens. And to take you on this journey, I'm your host, Mike Burton. And so with episode 17 comes the Lando miniseries. The miniseries is five issues long. Issue number one was released in July 2015. Issue number five was released October 2015. The trade paperback collection was released January 2016. And the Heroes for a New Hope collection was released in November 2016. For clarity, the Heroes of a New Hope is a collection of three miniseries, the first being Princess Leia, the second being Lando, and the third being Chewbacca. I did do the Princess Leia one around a month ago, so check about four episodes back and you'll be able to listen to the Princess Leia one as well, and then I'll be doing the Chewbacca one in a month or so too, so make sure you subscribe to Comics Emotion and stick around for that. The writer of the Lando comic is Charles Saul, who I speak about quite often on this show because he did the second run of Vader comics that I really like. Uh, he obviously did this Lando comic, he did the Obi-Wan and Anakin comics, I believe he's doing the new run of Star Wars comics, so he's done quite a few different things. Oh, and also the first episode of Star Wars comics in canon that I did with the Rise of Kylo Ren comics, which is a mini series as well, and it shows how Kylo Ren kind of became Kylo Ren in certain ways and how his lightsaber became red and all that sort of jazz so that's a really cracking episode go check out episode one of that because it is probably the best mini series I've read and this Lando one's great too so before we get into the sort of narrative side of things just a couple of little facts about Lando because that's what I like to do on this podcast Lando Calrissian's full name is actually Landonis Balthazar Calrissian you can see why he shortens Landonis to Lando he was born approximately 43 BBY, so 43 years before the Battle of Yavin, so at A New Hope when the Death Star blew up, he would have been 43 years old. Obviously, he wasn't around at that time, as in, in the film, he wasn't in it until Empire Strikes Back. Empire Strikes Back is around three years after A New Hope, so at the time of Empire Strikes Back, he would have been around 46 years old, which means he was around 78 years old when he was in Rise of Skywalker. Lando was born on Socorro. After losing the Falcon, which is shown in the solo Star Wars story film, uh, he sets up a mining operation on Lothal, which shows that if, if you've seen the series Star Wars Rebels, that he appears in that series in an episode or two, uh, which is what Lothal is basically all about. Um, he then became the Baron Administrator of Cloud City, which he won in a game of cards, which I found uh, quite interesting. And also the planet he was born on, Socorro, was basically like a it's a desert planet, but it's also not shown in the canon that much. I think in Legends it's been flushed out a bit more, but currently in the canon there isn't really that much about it. And just for clarity, there is another Lando comic called Lando Double or Nothing. That is set just before Solo, A Star Wars Story. And Solo, A Star Wars Story, the very first thing is like 13 years BBY, but the main story after there's the sort of montage where he's at war and things when he meets Tobias Beckett, that's around 10 BBY. So the Double or Nothing comic is set around 10 years before A New Hope, whereas this comic is actually set seems to be between A New Hope and Empire Strikes Back. The starting crawl that you get at the start of each comic, which if you follow me on Instagram, that genuine chit chat, I normally take photos of the cover as well as often the crawl. And in it, it says that Imperials are distracted by a growing alliance of rebels. Now, to me, that sounded like it wasn't until before A New Hope, because I assume distracted is kind of a light way of saying you've had your Death Star blown up. But looking online, it seems to be after A New Hope, so it's around that region. Also, a little bit of background information about the character Lobot, because he's in this comic quite a lot, and he's actually one of Lando's best friends. In the main films, you see him, and you would recognise him. He's a man, he looks like he's got some really, really retro headphones on. It's just, he's got this sort of metal bar with, like, blinking lights and buttons on it, going from ear, one ear, around the back of his head to the other. So it's almost like a horseshoe sort of shape, connecting on his ears. And just a little bit of information about him. His name is Lobot, and interestingly the name kind of comes from lobotomy because the implant that he has which is what i've described as almost looking like headphones in a sense is the aj6 cyborg construct the implant does show up in other places in canon a bit but specifically of lobot he was born on bespin and then he basically allowed the empire to implant the aj6 cyborg construct into him and exchange some of his personality for productivity and this was all done because he was paid to run battlefield calculations for the empire so he worked willingly for the empire for a while and then 
to make him better at his own job he agreed to allow this implant thing so he can interact with terminals and computers and things like that but he's always having to struggle with not letting it take over because it's connected directly into his brain if he's ever losing focus or anything like that then it can basically take him over essentially which is quite a terrifying thing but it is also a very cool concept so starting with the narrative, this is five issues, and the first issue starts with Lando sleeping with Moff Saria, and Moff is a rank in the Empire, um, one of the highest ranks is Grand Moff, and Tarkin was called Grand Moff Tarkin, um, so it, it's quite high up, Moff is like, yeah, high up in, in the Empire and things, and he sleeps with a female who is part of the Empire. He speaks with her for a little bit, and eventually basically manages to convince her to give him this golden orb he gives this golden orb to a character called Torrin because he owes him a lot of money and things and Torrin is a crime lord he doesn't show up in a huge amount of other things but he does pop up in the Afra and the Podameron comics as well he also has these things with him called elves which are like they're more like pixies than elves to be honest if we're thinking about sort of earth folklore so he's got these weird little elves with him that don't seem to really pop up in anything else apart from what he's in but yes it's a crime lord called Turen or Torren, t-o-r-e-n i may be pronouncing it wrong because i'm a scrub and essentially lando owes him a lot of money he gives him this orb hoping he'll wipe his debt clean and Torren says good that gets rid of like 10 percent of what you owe me lando's a bit outraged but then again he ends up agreeing to do another job for him and the agreement is to steal a ship now, the ship that they want him to steal is called the Imperialis. Now, the Imperialis is actually a pleasure yacht owned by Palpatine. If anyone has read the Aftermath trilogy, which I highly recommend, they're amazing, they're in the second and third ones, which is Life, Debt, and Empire's End. The Imperialis is mentioned, but it's more replicas of it are actually mentioned. Um, essentially, there's these things called observatories, and in the flashbacks, there's a character called Gallius Rex, and in these flashbacks, he's like a almost like a ward of Palpatine's in some senses. And he goes to these observatories, and a lot of these observatories that Palpatine's put across the universe contain replicas of the Imperialis. Alice. So he's very fond of the ship itself. And back to the story, I just want to confirm that Lando at present does not know that the ship is called the Imperialis, neither does he know that it's owned by Palpatine. To quote him, he just says, so there's a ship pleasure craft for some rich Imperial. So that's what he thinks it is. So after Lando speaks with Lobot about this, confirms and Lobot's a bit uneasy about the situation, but they don't really have much choice, Lando and Lobot go and recruit Aleskin and Pavel. Now, these two are alien clones, it seems to be, potentially clones of each other or clones of another being. It's not very clear, you don't ever get a clear answer, and the relationship is a bit odd. Visually, they look very much like the Black Panther from the Marvel Cinematic Universe, as in when T'Challa wears the Black Panther outfit, the black, and it looks very much like that, except instead of the Black Panther mask, imagine the face of an actual Black Panther. <laughs> so it's like a humanoid Black Panther sort of thing. Um, and you watch them fighting a bit, and they're really skilled fighters and whatnot, so they decide to get them into the scheme that they're doing, or job, as Lando calls it. And then they also speak to an antiques expert called Corin Purs. Now, Corin Purs is... In the comic, it calls it a Sava, S-A-V-A, which is actually a professor. And essentially, Corin is an Ugnaught. Uh, and an Ugnaught is, I've mentioned them in previous things, the best example of an Ugnaught is going to be Quill, who is in The Mandalorian. He's the one who says, I have spoken. So that's, if you've seen The Mandalorian, that's what you know. If you've seen Rebels or Clone Wars, you will have seen Ugnaughts in that. They, they are also in the main uh, Skywalker Saga films, the I think one of the first times you see them is in Empire Strikes Back. I believe when C-3PO goes into a room and he goes, oh my god, what's going on here? Ah, and then he falls to pieces and things. There are sort of Ugnaughts around. They're just really small little people, essentially, kind of. And they've got sort of like pig faces, almost. Um, so that's what an Ugnaught is. And just to clarify with Corin Purrs, Corin is also a female Ugnaught. So that's interesting. So it's like a professor, antiques expert, and an Ugnaught. Corrin also has a robotic eye, which is apparently Lando's fault due to a job going wrong or something similar, so she blames him for having that sort of eye. She doesn't want to take the mission and things, he passes her like a tablet which has got the information on there, and she gets very interested by it because her being an antiques expert and things, on this random ship, who knows what it is, obviously Palp's ship, on there there's loads of art and things like that, and Torrin, the gangster, basically said to them, look, if you can get the ship, you can keep everything that's on the inside, I just want the ship itself. So that's what grabs their attention and things. So they venture off to get this ship, and 
they managed to get it quite easily because it's unmanned. It's there for a refitting. Yeah, there's barely anyone around, maybe a couple of engineers. They managed to beat them up or whatever and sneak in and get to the ship. The ship is connected to this orbital shipyard, and once they get in there, Lobot very quickly hacks into the security systems with his cyborg construct, and then they fly away with it. Someone sees the ship flying away, and then notifies the Emperor, and then issue two starts. As they're flying the ship away, three Imperial Star Destroyers appear and approach the ship. They blow up the orbital shipyard that the ship was initially docked in, and then they try and use gravity mines on the ship itself. Now, gravity mines seem to basically, they connect to the ship and stick on them, kind of, I assume, magnetized, and weigh them down to prevent them to be able to go through hyperspace or anything. And then also, if the ship does manage to go through hyperspace or anything like that gets too far, then the mines will explode. Fortunately, they manage to avoid these mines or shoot them and it kind of blows them up and things and then the star destroyers start getting closer and closer trying to get them in a tractor beam so both star destroyers get the ship in the tractor beam at once and the two star destroyers are sort of parallel and uh, the imperialist is in the middle of them and what happens is that lando uses this trick to kind of disable the both of them he makes them both pull in like the ship's in the middle and both of them are trying to pull in with the tractor beam because both imperial officers of the star destroyers want to get credit for getting palp's ship back and things and then they get closer and closer and lando manages to kind of zip out of it essentially and they hit each other which is a very foolish thing to do and it disables both the star destroyers then lando's ship leaves and manages to stay fly away and go in hyperspace and things and the remaining commander because i presume the other two star destroyers completely blow up you see them tap each other in a little explosion it doesn't explicitly confirm they're both blown up but judging by the rest of this comic i think they were there's one ship left and the commander of that ship is someone called idel and what's interesting is something i didn't expect at all is that when his sort of second in command asks him you know what should we do essentially he lifts a gun up to his head and says i hear the rebellion is hiring and then it cuts and i've checked online he doesn't appear in anything else so this imperial officer for failing to get palps i keep saying palp i mean palpatine slash the emperor just to clarify i call him palp um because obviously he couldn't get palp's ship he literally kills himself which is pretty damn brutal i mean that's a lot to deal with in star wars but Anyway, there's a character called Chanath Char who is contacted by Palpatine to basically try and pursue and get the Imperialis back because it means a lot to him. Now, Chanath Char is a bounty hunter and she actually appears in the second run of Darth Vader comics as well, which is also written by Charles Saul. So nice little connection there. Then they're kind of exploring the ship, the crew, and uh, Corrin says there seems to be treasure everywhere, and it's amazing, and they're going to make loads of money from it and things, and then there's one door they can't get into that's completely locked, and they can't get into there at all. So Lobot goes in there, he connects it, manages to get through the door, the doors open, and there's two royal guards standing there, and one of them just immediately stabs Lobot through the sort of chest shoulder region. Now regarding the Emperor's Royal Guard, you see them most prominently in Revenge of the Sith as well as Return of the Jedi. In Revenge of the Sith, when Yoda walks into where Palpatine's office is, there's two guards there in completely in red with sort of black visors and Yoda walks in immediately just force pulls them straight to the wall and they collapse most in the films when you see them they don't seem very impressive but in the wider canon they are very very formidable they were actually if you've seen the Clone Wars series or I believe in Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones there are some Senate guards as well as some Naboo guards and things quite high up in that a lot of the people who were that once palpatine sort of turned the republic into the empire some of the best members of the guard would become the emperor's royal guard changing their cerulean armor to which is like a blue color to the red which is a lot more <laughs> evil seeming and things and also the praetorian guards which are shown in the last jedi they are very heavily influenced by the royal guard the emperor's royal guard are meant to be yeah, elite fighters or sort of top of the reins they are there's not really meant to be that, that many people who are better than them at fighting and things apart from you could maybe argue inquisitors but apart from that it's they're, they're pretty top tier so pretty scary things to come across so issue three starts and Lobot's injuries are very severe. He could basically lose his mind to the implant because he's having to worry about this wound and trying to like not die from this wound. He can't focus on the implant not taking over his brain as much. So he's kind of like panicking in that regard. So Lando and Corrin decide to get him into a back to tank, um, which is in Empire Strikes Back after Luke gets attacked by the Yeti-like thing in the cave. 
and the species of that is a Wampa. And after Luke gets attacked by that, he goes into that big sort of tube vat filled with clear-ish liquid, and he's got a breathing tube on. That's a Bacta tank. It's much more heavily used in Legends and things, but in the canon, you can see Vader in Rogue One. He's actually in a Bacta tank when he's sort of resting and things. So it's basically just a super healing capsule thing that you sit in with loads of special water that heals you. So they put Lobot in one of those. And while that's all going on, the alien clone twins that are kind of like Black Panther, they start to fight the royal guards. Then Chanath Char is gifted a, a ship called the Scimitar by the Empire, more specifically by Palpatine. Now, interestingly, the Scimitar is actually in Episode 1, The Phantom Menace, because it's actually the ship that Darth Maul flies. So when he lands on Tatooine and him and Qui-Gon have that little quick skirmish, that ship, and also it's shown in the Son of Dathomir comics, which I've spoken about before, basically Darth Maul's ship... That was the Scimitar and things, and it's a modified ship of sorts. And then once Palps basically captured more, which happens in the Clone Wars, he took a ship, seemingly. And when Chanath Chart is given the ship, she's given it by this droid called 066, which I wonder if that's a little nod to Order 66. I only just thought of that. But 066 doesn't really show up in any other canon, so it's not really important at this time. It's just a droid helper, in air quotes. While that's happening, Lando and Corin go and try and help the twins. Then it flashes back, and Chanath removes the head of 066 and while tracking the Imperialis because she doesn't trust this droid. And then the twins killed the guards, but it turns out that the royal guards were actually corrupted by something. And it seems to be some sort of ancient Sith artifact that has caused... Seemingly, the theory by Corrin is that there's loads of Sith artifacts and things. They're very much imbued with the dark side of the Force. And because Corrin used to study a lot of things and essentially studied a lot of Jedi things, that was her speciality. And then when the Empire took over and basically banned everything to do with Jedi, she lost her job and was basically disgraced from being the Savar or the professor that she was. So that's a little bit of backstory about her, which is not necessarily necessary. But that all happens. And then someone comments saying, oh, maybe they all just look like that underneath. Maybe they have been corrupted by something. And then Lando says, oh, no, but there was this one woman I knew who was a guard, and she was impressive. And then one of them goes, look, I don't want to hear about that story. But this comic does a really good job of keeping Lando's charm in, and a lot of the dialogue is very, very Lando, and it's brilliant. And the third comic ends with a helmet that's kind of on a plinth, in a sense. It's in the middle of this room. It's, it's on this nice little stand, and it's a helmet, and its eyes glow in the final panel of the comic. So the fourth comic starts with Chanath Char entering the Imperialis. Um, while that's happening, Lando basically is speaking with Corrin, and it's just a little funny thing I noted, which was they were talking about if they could sell some of these Sith artifacts, how much money they would make and things. And uh, Corrin says that they'd make enough money to be able to buy their own moon. And Lando says that he would call his moon Lando Land because the galaxy needs Lando Land, which is brilliant. I hope one day we do get a Lando Land. Not necessarily in canon i mean like in the real universe hopefully star wars galaxy's edge opens up and we get a lando land but regardless um after that little conversation about lando land um the twins get possessed essentially they're left in this room and they're kind of looking at this helmet thing quite a lot one of them seemingly gets possessed and then attacks the other one and cuts off their arm and they're actually speaking and this is the first time you've actually heard them speak at all in the comic you're kind of it's meant to seem like they're kind of silent in a certain way then it cuts back, Corrin explains more about Sith lore and things, and just gives a bit more depth about the Jedi and the Sith, and how the Sith are like the opposite of the Jedi, and a lot of people don't know about the Sith, but they are very powerful, Dark Side of the Force. Lando has a very Han sort of attitude towards it, where he doesn't really believe in the Force, or any of that sort of jazz. And Corrin says that they want to leave, because it's very unnerving being around here, and it's very unpleasant. As that's all happening, Chanath Char goes in and changes the operating system of the ship itself, and basically disables all uses of escape pods, so no one can escape. While this is happening, Corrin and Lando have a conversation. Lando wants to stay, because he wants to take some stuff, and also save Lobot, whereas Corrin is like, no, I want to leave and things. So Corrin walks away, and then gets a gun put to her head by Chanath Char. And Chanath asks if Corrin is alone, Corrin says that they are, and then Lando approaches, Chanath recognises him, and decides not to kill him, and doesn't kill Corrin either. And then things start to kind of go a bit weird, and then Chanath Char says, you don't understand what's in here, you don't know what kind of stuff is hidden away, this ship is only going to bring you death if you stay here. And then the fifth and final issue, basically... 
Chandler Charles says she wants to blow the ship up, whereas Lando wants the artifacts and things, and Corin supports that because the artifacts are priceless and as a scholar they're very interesting that sort of thing whereas Chanath keeps saying no it's not worth it you don't want to lose your life Lando then mentions Lobot and then suddenly she is immediately interested and to quote her I'm listening and then while this is all being discussed and trying to work out what's going on the twins appear and then it's very clear that they've both fully been possessed by now and one of them gives Corin the helmet and speaks to them about this this helmet and as Corrin is admiring this helmet and saying yeah maybe I could stay maybe the artifacts will give me a bit more information and that sort of thing kind of almost being drawn to the helmet in a certain way one of the twins just stabs her with a lightsaber straight through the body killing her immediately Chanath shoots the door and there's a door between them and it just closes so that Lando and Chanath can sort of escape and things now I just want to say here the the helmet itself is actually in other works as well the helmet is actually from once again the second run of darth vader comics which was written by charles saul and there's an arc in there to do with a sith called momin and this helmet seemingly is the exact same helmet as of that it possesses people it makes people go around a bit strange and if you actually wear it it can possess you so i'm only briefly mentioning it there because i am going to be doing the darth vader run of comics further down the line and as i said there's like a whole arc all about this sith artifact the helmet and it's a really really cool arc as well but it is cool that the artifact is here in this lando comic and it's also in the darth vader comic so if you've read the second darth vader comics you'll know what the the helmet of momin is like coming back to the story lando manages to get lobot out of the back tank while Chanith requests that 066 returns. 066 refuses to, because it basically says, well, the scimitar is the next most important thing. That's been what I've been tasked with to make sure that that's okay. You've rigged this ship to blow up now to try and get the people who are stuck on board. So if I fly the ship nearby, there's actually a chance that the scimitar is actually going to blow up. So I'm not going to take that risk. Um, and then it just literally flies the ship away. Somehow, with it being just a head, it's managed to kind of get itself with two little mechanical arms and manages to just, yeah, fly the ship away. And while Chanath is sort of distracted by that conversation, the twin that's only got one arm, which also now has a lightsaber, goes for Chanath, but Chanath manages to sidestep it and not get killed. Then it goes back to what Lando is doing with Lobot, like getting him out of the back to tank and basically speaking to him and things. The other twin with both his arms appears and speaks to Lando and Lando says, look, if you want to stay here, you can keep the artifacts and stuff. And the twin's like, well, no, you, you've rigged the ship to blow up. I'm not that stupid. And Lando says, well, what I can do is I can try and convince Chanath to not blow up the ship. If we can somehow get it out of her and stop the ship blowing up, then you guys can keep the ship and let us go. Would, would that be OK instead of us having to fight and things? You know, I'm not much of a fighter. I don't, you know, I don't really even know what end the blaster bolt comes out of the blaster. I'm useless. And as soon as the twin turns off the lightsaber, immediately Lando shoots the hand and he drops the lightsaber and then shoots him straight in the chest. And Lobot's a bit like, whoa, I kind of where did that come from? Because that's not usually Lando's style. And just a bit of Lando dialogue here. Lando and Lobot. So Lobot says, how did you do that? I thought you hated blasters. And Lando says, I was bluffing. And Lobot says, your entire life? And Lando says, bluffing doesn't work if people know you're bluffing. Everyone knows Lando Carizian doesn't fight. He gets on by charm and luck. Only ones who know differently are dead. And Lobot says, that's encouraging. So that's quite a darker side to Lando, but it's, it's quite a clever one it does show how he's managed to survive so far not solely on charm alone but they managed to get to chanath and then lobot is immediately like chanath you're the one that's been on the ship causing all this sort of things you're the woman that lando referred to and they have a conversation of sorts and basically say look we're stuck on here the ship's going to blow up soon and the way out is gone don't really know what we can do and lobot says look you can plug me in and i can deactivate whatever's stopping the ship the escape pods going off because when chanath char logged in and disabled all the escape pods she was only given the codes by palpatine to actually disable things not to enable them so Lobot says, after being plugged in, that he can't stop the auto-destruct because it's hardwired in. However, what he can do is reactivate the escape pods, which is what he does. But while this is all going on, obviously he's very wounded and things. He hasn't managed to have a proper amount of time to heal in the Bacta tank. And he's been pulled out quite quickly and things. And now he's plugging himself into an Imperial machine. His little head device thing is saying, Neural reroute 84% complete. Reroute 
85% complete and it's going up more and more and more as each panel goes on and it's basically showing that while he's distracted and sorting out other things to save Lando and Shanath that the implant is slowly taking over his mind while that's going on there Lando says oh I felt like I almost lost you there buddy and Lobot says Lando I'm already lost I can't do both at the same time I can't crack into the ship and I can't fight the implants and Lando's like don't be ridiculous you know, you're Lobot you can do it and then the escape pods get activated, you hear a little announcement, and then they go, see, I told you, Lobot, and then they look down at Lobot slumped on the floor, and you can hear the little transmitter thing saying, neural reroute 100% complete. While that's happening, the autodestruct is commencing, they've got about 10 seconds to leave, and Lando and Chanath speak, and Lando says, look, come on with us, Chanath, come, you know, Lobot may become himself again, if he knows that you're around waiting and things. And she says, look, I'm sorry. Lobot made the choice. He picked you. I stopped waiting for him a long time ago. And Lobot is just kind of standing there like a mannequin almost. And she says, I would tell him I knew this would happen, but it doesn't look like he'd care about that or really anything at all. So goodbye, Lando. And she gets an escape pod and goes off and he gets into an escape pod with Lobot. And he says, I don't know if you can hear me, but I swear I'll do everything I can to cure you. I'll find a way. And the escape pod jettisons out and they basically all escape happily ever after in air quotes, maybe not for Lobot. And that's where the comic ends. Now, there's one little bit I haven't mentioned, which is actually the final things is once Lando has said, I can cure you or try and find a way, something in Lobot's construct turns on and says, hey, Lando, if you're hearing this recording, I'm gone. And you just said the word cure. So I'm just going to read what Lobot's essentially final recorded words were and just for clarity in the rest of the canon after this point which is shown in Empire Strikes Back and things Lobot is completely mute so I'm just going to read the little recording that came out of Lobot's mind so after he said if you're hearing this you just said the word cure I bet it didn't take you very long either maybe you'll pull it off I wouldn't put it past you I've seen you beat crazy odds but even if you don't I'm not angry about what happened to me not now and definitely not by the time you hear this I live by my choices I don't think I have very much time left. Let me get to it. You have a power, Lando. People follow you. They willingly become chips in your game, cards in your deck. And that's an amazing thing. It's how you do the things you do. We're in luck. So here's what I'd like to tell you. While I'm still your friend of many years instead of whatever I'm about to become, stop playing the game. Fold. Find something to believe in other than yourself. Use that power you have, that luck, all that charm and do something good with it. Lando, old buddy, you're better than this. And obviously Lando does say old buddy. I think he calls Han that at some point as well. And so shortly after that, I believe that that's when Lando went to Bespin. He then won the card game, became the Baron Administrator. And then obviously the whole thing with Han, Leia and Chewie happens. And then after that, he joins the Rebellion. So Lobot's sacrifice in a lot of ways not only saved Lando and Shanath's life, but also... I think gave Lando like an epiphany, one of those moments of clarity where he kind of realized maybe I shouldn't be so selfish and things. And obviously Han had, well, Han had very similar moments to that in the solo Star Wars story. And then obviously in A New Hope, it really turns around a lot more. But that's basically the end of the comic. And I think it's a really, really good comic. It it brings some depth to Lando and some unusually good depth to Lobot, which before reading this comic is not something that I thought I wanted, but I definitely realised I did now. Something that was definitely lacking in my Star Wars canon knowledge. But yeah, that's basically it from me, guys. Um, A couple other little things just before I go. Next week is going to be the Vader Down comic, which is essentially a crossover event between the main run of Star Wars comics and the first run of the Darth Vader comics. If you've been listening to all the episodes or a lot of the previous ones before, you'll know I've done volumes one and two of both the main run of Star Wars comics and the first run of the Vader comics. So this Vader Down is kind of like the third annual for both of them, the third volume, but is also its own standalone thing. I would really recommend people read Vader Down before I even go into it next week because it is incredible and it's one of the best Vader stories in my opinion and it's just loads of Vader being really badass which is cool but that's what you can expect next week the week after that I haven't really figured out what I'm going to do yet I think I'm going to do Galaxy's Edge but we shall see and then the week after that will be the next volume of Star Wars I also say that I've got another show called Genuine Chit Chat that if any of you listen to the end you're probably sick of me saying it but I have another show it's called Genuine Chit Chat wherever you're listening to this you should be able to find it it's on Spotify it's on Apple and Google Podcasts Stitcher Podbean all those sort of other places and I just have a different guest on every episode or so and yeah just chat with people about things that 
I find interesting, things that they find interesting. It's much more about the guests. Obviously, this podcast, you just listen to me chat for 20 minutes to half an hour, whereas Genuine Chit Chat is much more about the guests. I've had the guys from Comics in Motion on. I've had Tony Freena from Indie Comics Spotlight, Max Byrne of Mandatory Marvel in DC. I've got one planned for Scott Weatherly of 20th Century Geek. There's loads of other podcasters that I've collaborated with that have come on the show and things. And there's lots of people who aren't podcasters who are inspirational, blind directors, blind travelers, uh, people who are very much into their own religion and they like to speak about that sort of thing, including someone who's a member of the Church of Satan. That was a very interesting conversation. And loads of crazy other things like that. So if you want an experience like that, go check out Genuine Chit Chat. If not, and you're just happy to listen to Star Warsy stuff, so make sure you subscribe to Comics in Motion's feed, and then every Saturday you should be hearing a new episode of Star Wars Comics in Canon. I want to thank you guys for listening, especially right to the end. And as always, guys, may the Force be with you.